As a kid growing up in the UK, the Royal Institution Christmas Lectures fascinated me. I was never lucky enough to actually go to the lectures in person, but I watched them on TV, in fact on a new channel called BBC Two. The Royal Society in London has a tradition of staging science lectures going back to 1799. With Humphrey Davy, and even Michael Faraday. In the 1970s, a friendly, straight-talking Yorkshire engineer called Eric Olathwaite was invited to host four Christmas lectures. The title of today's lecture is an invitation to study odds and evens. We've spent some time now on left and right, front and back, top and bottom. Lathwaite's claim to fame was his work on linear motors and magnetism. When used on the horizontal and made in a much larger size, such a machine is capable of developing a very high acceleration. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. On the night of 8th of November, 1974, Eric delivered his final talk. He named it The Engineer Through the Looking Glass. It was far more challenging than his previous three talks. And I think Lathwaite was having a go at the British establishment, who loved to dismiss the ideas of working class and especially Northern scientists. Are these discoveries new? Well, not entirely. I have had letters from all kinds of people who have done similar experiments before, and for one reason or another have given up for one, lack of know-how and scientific background, two, lack of money and workshop facilities, three, lack of courage, <laughs> four, lack of anyone to listen, especially for now today I've got all of you here ready to listen. What a pleasure it is to talk to young people who are ready to listen after you've talked to adults. Lathwaite was no stranger to controversy. He did everything he could to promote his new motor. This is just a, a rough model of an ordinary rotary motor that goes round and round, but it's got a zipper on it, so you can split it and unroll it. Right. Now, instead of the magnetic field going round and round, it now travels in a straight line, if you flatten that out. Mm -hmm. and so we, here we've got a real one. This was only made of rubber, of course. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've not experienced this before, it's very unusual. We'll switch it on. This is an aluminium plate. I'd like you to hold it over the motor and tell us what you feel. <laughs> Well, it, it wants to go to the left or to the right. It's also the... got a lifting force on it, yes. doesn't it? So if I just turn the juice up a little bit and I let it go, you'll see just how it goes. Eric envisaged that his new motor would transform an aging British rail system. Mr. 
This is a scale model of a high-speed transport system using a transverse flux motor. Inside the track, there is a row of horseshoe magnets arranged sideways, each with its own magnetizing coil. But in this case, the vehicle itself switches on the track as it needs it ahead of itself by passing over a series of photoelectric cells. Unfortunately, the levitation system doesn't readily scale up because a full-size one would be too expensive in terms of power input and in terms of track cost. But the air cushion principle, which was invented by Sir Christopher Cockerell for hovercraft, can be married to the linear motor to produce what is called a tracked hovercraft. By 1970, he ran tests to prove the theory. The vehicle combined lift from a hovercraft and a linear motor for movement. This is no model. This is the real thing. An air cushion vehicle running on a concrete track in Cambridgeshire. This vehicle is driven by a linear motor which is designed for speeds up to 150 miles an hour. Nearly two miles of track, so flat and straight that the eye can detect no flaws, is an impressive sight in itself. The British government, at first, invested in Lathwaite's new transport idea. Coils are being dropped into slots in a laminated steel core. But soon cancelled the programme, citing economic constraints as their reason. Eric made a fuss, saying, a crank is a crank until proved correct, which of course did not go down well at the top table. Maybe Q can make something out of it. I want that ready for Ackman's tea party. Undaunted, he relaunched the train project by dropping the hovercraft idea and making the whole vehicle ride solely by magnetic levitation. It lifts, it propels, it's stable sideways, twist, see how rapidly it recovers when you disturb it. And you haven't really seen electromagnetic levitation until I turn up the current to its full value. And then see what happens. This is a truly amazing machine. It's as if there were some kind of a magnetic groove along which this will travel. It's stable in all three axes, both rotationally and translationally, and it will propel itself as well. Let's just see it again. He called the system Maglev and said, I've made a motor not only that propels the train, but also gives you lift and guidance for nothing. It sounded like the future. But the UK was not interested in Maglev. France, Japan, Germany and China have all built successful linear motor levitating test tracks and embraced the concept.
shunned and ignored, Lathwaite left industry and joined Imperial College as a professor of engineering. I'm like a child who's been brought up inside an institution and has never seen the outside world, the sea or trees in a wood and so on. And I've been coming here was like being taken out of that box and put into the marvelous real world that there is. And I've simply been standing and gazing in wonder at all the things that there are in the universe. And I'd just like to live to be 200 because one lifetime isn't enough. It was there his other fascination, this time with gyroscopes, would be the new focus of his research. Lathwaite observed that when a gyro spins, it produces a precession motion 90 degrees to the axis of its rotation. You can make a spinning gyroscope rise up in the air as if defying the force of gravity. Maybe because of his upbringing, or maybe because he'd been constantly blocked by the establishment, in 1974 he decided to demonstrate to the nation a gyroscope acting like an anti-gravity machine, live on television. This is an experiment with a spinning wheel, a rather large wheel, 13 inches diameter, mounted in a ball bearing on a shaft three feet long. I am going to hold it like this and swing it in a circle and lift it with one hand, but only when it's spinning. First of all, let me weigh it to show you just how heavy it is. As I talk, you'll see that lifting it is quite an effort. It weighs about 40 pounds, and I can't lift it any higher than that without a lot of strain. So now we'll spin it up to two and a half thousand revs a minute, at which point it becomes a live thing. Then I shall lift it five feet in three seconds by going round in a big circle. Whilst I'm doing it, I shall talk to you so that you shall tell from my voice that I'm not under any stress of any kind. Now in a minute I shall let go with my left hand and holding this remote end of the shaft only I shall lift the wheel through five feet all on its own with no effort on my part. All I do is apparently just to steer it along a path that it's already decided it would like to go. Then there's the question of how you stop the wheel. that speed, that wheel has enough energy to throw itself 200 feet in the air. Did you notice that as it went round in a circle, there was no centrifugal force trying to pull my arm out sideways? Let's just do it once more to save time. We've already spun it up. So here goes 40 pounds of wheel as light as a feather. This is not a conjuring trick. This is a fact of science. Watch it again carefully. A fact about a spinning wheel that so far everyone has missed. There was a stunned 
silence. I remember it well. He unleashed the floodgates of the scientific establishment's wrath. You've brought science into disrepute, and you have done something against the run of the tide, and even Lathwaite is no longer part of the club. Eric counted by saying, Look here, I know I have something worth investigating. Don't dismiss me as a lunatic. Sadly, this whole affair harmed his career considerably. He left his position at the Royal Institution, and although credited with inventing the linear motor, he has never been included in the Oxford Dictionary of Science. In my opinion, Eric Lathwaite was brilliant and stupidly ignored by the great and good of Britain. But what Eric Lathwaite really did was to produce a generation of little Lathwaite scientists whom, like me, are not afraid to tackle the unpromising and the controversial. I thank you, Eric, so much for that. Never stop asking questions because the truth is out there. Thank <laughs> you.